So for those geometrically inclined, you can try to work out this math, but uh, the fun fact of the day is that the International Space Station is actually closer to Earth than the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, so that may put things in perspective for you. Thank you all for joining. This is our bi-weekly office hour session. I'm going to begin by giving an overview of ResFrac, probably just three to five minutes, and then we'll dive into the topic today, which is setting up a cluster spacing sensitivity and some of the considerations that you may raise in doing so. So as a very high level overview of ResFrac, we are a coupled hydraulic fracture and reservoir simulator. And the goal of coupling those processes is to maximize economic returns and be able to sensitize on design decisions like cluster spacing to maximize our objective function, whether that's total production, EUR, or more commonly MPV, rate of return, IRR, et cetera. And so the key to being able to do so accurately is coupling all these very dynamic processes that are happening in the subsurface. So that begins with fracture propagation, where we have uh, rocks actually cracking and fluid creating hydraulic fractures in three dimensions. And then propant is transported and deposited in those fractures. And you can see here, there's a gradation and concentration of where that propant ends up. Then we need to know how much oil or gas we're going to produce as a result. And the simulator will do a full three-dimensional calculation of how the matrix fluids then flow into those cracks in the rock and eventually into the well bore up to the surface where we can then sell them. And then a final component that's all integrated into the ResFrac solution are the poroelastic and thermoelastic stress changes throughout the duration of production. So as we deplete that rock, we take fluids out of the matrix and there is a corresponding stress change that occurs along and around those areas of depletion. So if we put this all into a video, uh, this is a simulation of five wells. We're going to have two parent wells that are going to frack sequentially one after the other and then come online for five years. Those wells will then be shut in and we're going to frack the offsetting three wells and we'll see interaction between wells uh, and any implication of the depletion. So starting, we can see here is the first well being fractured with that prop and distribution in the fractures. We're going to production, you see depletion, and now we're actually simul fracking the three wells uh, infilling between the two parents. And then once again, we'll go into depletion. So over the last three years since uh, our founding, uh, we've worked pretty much all major plays across the Americas. And that is the uh, experience from which we draw upon to uh, make recommendations such as the correct workflow for cluster spacing optimization, which we're going to talk about momentarily. Uh, as a company, we both license and consult. Uh, you can email me afterwards and happy to talk to you about either. And finally, launching February next year, we are leading a second industry study. This one focused on parent-child relationships. As you just saw in the last video, uh, we our simulator is uniquely capable of capturing these interactions. So you can see here in the image, this is actually that same simulation where we have these parent fractures that are initially hydrocarbon filled. You can see this fracture right here. There is water from the child well intersecting and filling those parent fractures. So we're going to use the ResFrac simulator as a tool to help describe what are the physics and phenomena happening during frac hits, and then use that intuition and finding to deliver prescriptive and actionable recommendations to those participants on mitigating frac hit damage. So without further ado, today's topic is how do you set up cluster spacing sensitivities? Uh, I think it's a common subject 
to look at and is one of the dominant value drivers when we look at design sensitivities. So what I'm going to go through briefly today are the motivation uh, behind why we might consider things like cluster spacing. And then also uh, setup considerations. So particular things to pay attention to as you set up the simulations. Particular ResFrac features that may make your life easy uh, when doing those simulation setups. And then evaluation metrics in terms of how do we compare different cluster spacing scenarios. So for motivation, on the right hand side, I've included a image from a paper that we wrote with Hess a couple of years ago, looking at cluster spacing in the Utica under two different permeability assumptions. But even if we just look at one of these curves, we very quickly can see that the impact of cluster spacing is can be very pronounced. So going from the optimal of about 25 to 30 foot cluster spacing to even just 50 foot cluster spacing, you can lose about 20% of the MPV on a section basis if you were to repeat that design. And for this reason, many uh, operators focus on cluster spacing optimization when they're using ResFrac to look at how to improve well designs. And one of the guiding principles, uh, at least when assessing these simulations, is that we consistently see that the fracture area created next to the well is worth more than the fracture area created at the tips of the fracture or far away from the well. And so there's an argument to be made for closer cluster spacing to maximize that near well fracture area. However, conversely, that will also uh, generally produce shorter fractures if you're normalized on volume uh, and potentially induce more stress uh, and therefore lower your perforation efficiency. And so optimal cluster spacing is a complex function uh, with many governing parameters, maybe the most important of which are the hydrocarbon viscosity and compressibility, permeability of the rock, as well as the geomechanics that then impact the degree of stress shadowing from opening cracks in that rock. So for more detail on how we did this in the Utica data set, um, feel free to shoot me a message and I'm happy to pass you that paper uh, and you can read the full text. So as we considered the different facets of setting up a series of sensitivity analyses to look at cluster spacing, our guiding principle is going to be the golden rule, which is to modify only one parameter at a time. It's often very tempting to just compare two different designs, say a 3,500 pound per foot at seven foot cluster spacing versus 2,500 pounds at 30 foot cluster spacing. The, the challenge with doing so is that you're now changing two parameters at once and it's very difficult to then assign the benefit or detriment of that scenario to one parameter or the other. So what I'm going to focus on today are some of the considerations to make sure that as you set up cluster sensitivities, you're only modifying the cluster spacing and not other parameters unintentionally. So what that boils down to are uh, mesh resolution, you want that to remain consistent, along with stage length, the pump schedule, so pounds per foot, gallons per foot, but also the ramp schedule and how you're, how you're pumping and at what rate. And then maybe the more complex one to think about is this concept of perforation friction. So that's what we'll spend a little bit of time going through on the slides. So to review meshing within ResFrac, we have three separate meshes that are non-conforming. There is a mesh that defines the wellbore, a separate mesh for your matrix region, and then a third mesh that meshes the fractures. So when I'm talking about mesh resolution and keeping that constant, 
the one that I want, or the two that I'd like to keep constant are the well bore element length. So whatever you set up the base model resolution on your well bore element should remain constant. And we recommend having that resolution to be less than your cluster spacing. And so that's something to keep in mind when you set up that base model. Uh, and a, the same equivalency it can be applied to the matrix where we like to set up the matrix such that you have at least one matrix element in the direction of SH min for each perforation cluster. However, you want to keep that same resolution, so the width of each of these matrix cells the same between your different sensitivity runs. So therefore, at the beginning, on the onset of your modeling, when you first set up your base case that you're going to history match, you want to keep in mind what your eventual tightest cluster spacing is that you want to test, such that you set your initial mesh resolution to be adequate for the tightest or closest cluster spacing that you may run. And equivalently, that would apply to the wellbore mesh as well, where you'd want your wellbore mesh elements to be of a length such that you'd have uh, no more than one perforation element per, uh, or per no more than one perforation per wellbore element. Uh, and then, of course, when you go to wider cluster spacing, it's OK to keep that same finer mesh resolution. Yes, the simulation will run a little bit slower, but that way you know any differences are truly due to cluster spacing and not any mesh artifact of changing that, that mesh size. Now, all this said, if you do set up an initial simulation and you have uh, want to do a tight cluster spacing, which would result in more than one perforation per matrix element. It is better to keep that resolution the same than to then to instead fine or refine your mesh. So the code is set up where it can handle multiple perforations per element. It'll just make the picture a little bit blockier and you won't be able to see the, the pressure or depletion in happening in between uh, perforations or fractures. But that is a better solution than to use a different mesh resolution. Next, along the lines of keeping all your parameters constant other than cluster spacing, we recommend keeping the same stage length and so that means you won't have a perfect distribution of cluster spacings, right? Because you'll be limited to integer values of the number of clusters per stage. But again, we want to assess what the impact of cluster spacing is, not the impact of stage length. So that could be set, structured as a separate sensitivity. Similarly, you might want to look at the impact of prop and ramping, different pump schedules, uh, different prop and loadings. Again, all of these are very great sensitivities to run, but in order to independently assess the impact of each of these parameters, we really recommend just doing one at a time. And finally, that brings us to perforation friction, or sometimes called limited entry. So perforation, perforation friction is the back pressure that results from trying to force fluid through a hole. So if the left-hand side of this image is the inside of my casing, and this slot here is my perforation, as I force fluid out of that perforation, there is a pressure drop that occurs. And that is this concept of perforation friction. So the smaller the area that is open to flow, the greater the back pressure, the more I have to push to force the fluid out of that perforation at a given rate. And so we can see the equation over here on the right and the relationship of these parameters. So this perforation friction or limited entry scales with the square of flow rate. And then the inverse of the square of the number of perforations, the diameter and the coefficient of discharge. So why do we care about this? there is a propensity to increase perforation efficiency 
when perforation friction is higher. And that is because it more evenly distributes the fluid across the entire stage. And so to assess what the impact of, again, cluster spacing is, we want to try to normalize this perforation friction in between sensitivity runs. And then later we may come back and look at what the benefit or impact of changing that perforation friction is. So along these lines, if my base case has eight clusters per stage with four perfs per cluster with 0.4 inch diameter holes, and I assume I'm pumping water with a density of 10 pounds per gallon and uh, injecting at 80 barrels a minute, I can plug those values in and get what my designed perforation friction value was, in this case, about 800 PSI. So if I then run a sensitivity where I want to see what the impact of reducing cluster spacing by 50% is, or in other words, adding 12 clusters to that same stage length, then as at a first run, to just see what the difference in that cluster spacing impact is, I should try to normalize perforation efficiency. And you can see there's several parameters that I could vary with. I wanna keep injection rate the same because we already said we want the pump schedule the same, but I can change the number of perforations as well as the diameter. So if I go to 12 clust clusters across the stage with now three instead of four perforations, and I reduce the diameter from 0.4 to 0.377, then I end up at 801 PSI, which is, for all intents and purposes, the same designed perforation friction. And in that regard, I can, I can compare the two results directly side by side. And then, of course, there are practical limitations. Uh, you know, I probably can't go to a gun manufacturer and say, I want to change the hole from 0 0.4 to 0 0.337. And so I may run a second iteration where I then actually run the as implemented or realistic real world case. But I do so having already separated, separated out what the impact of cluster spacing is versus any impact on the perforation friction or limited entry that may result as a change of those perforation designs. And then finally, at tighter cluster spacings, stress shadowing tends to elevate when we squeeze more clusters into the same length of lateral. And that may diminish perforation efficiency uh, where some perforations may not initiate. And so there's been a body of literature in the last five years, really accelerated in the last maybe two years about limited entry and extreme limited entry. This is something that we consistently test in ResFrac and see normally uh, high returns too. Uh, and so you, as you investigate tighter cluster spacings, you may very well want to run another round of sensitivities looking at that higher perforation friction uh, or extreme limited entry designs. So in terms of features for helping set these things up, uh, if we return to uh, our constants that we want to normalize. We want to keep the same mesh resolution, the same stage length, same pump schedule. And so really our only parameters that we're going to modify are on the wells and perforations tab where we may modify our, our perforation design as well as the number of clusters. So there are two ways to do so. And I'll flip over to the UI here just to walk through this in an easy fashion. But conceptually, the, the two options are the inline method, which is a simplified input method where it evenly distributes the clusters along your stages. And so you just say how many shots per cluster and how many clusters per stage and a diameter. And so it treats each cluster as the same. So the same number of shots and same diameter of those shots per, for each cluster. Uh, and you could vary the number of clusters per stage if you wanted. Uh, and it makes the setup very simple, very easy. Alternatively, you can also specify one at a time where you actually get a table and you can specify an MD or an XYZ location of each individual cluster. And then you could assign a different diameter or different number of perforations to each cluster. 
For instance, if you had implemented a tapered perforation scheme with more holes toward the toe or toward the heel, uh, then you may opt to represent that using this specify one at a time. So if I switch over to the UI, I can open up a simulation And if I come to my wells and perforations tab, you can see each of my wells. I can expand the well. And this one is set up as perforation clusters one at a time. And so you can see I have a table here of where the, I have the measured depth of each of my clusters. And then I can specify the associated parameters if I want, and you can see in this case, I have the same design all the way across the stage. And so it may be simpler for me to actually use the inline method. So up at the top, I can choose the specify inline. And if I scroll down, you'll now see it's asking me that I have three stages in this well. I need to specify the number of clusters, the shots per cluster, and then the diameter of those shots and a coefficient of discharge. This last parameter is the cluster toe gap. Uh, that's if you have a gap for the plug in between stages, you can put in a distance here and it'll add an additional space in between clusters. So that is one way to represent it, or you can use the table design. So as we discussed, some of the reasons why you might use the specify one at a time table is if you had some sort of tapered design so that your perforation distribution along the stage varies rather than having that flat, or if you had uneven cluster spacing within a stage. I haven't seen that very often, but it, it may happen. And then a third reason you might do it is if you, it, you have more flexibility for defining that stage across the lateral. So if you had a gap in the lateral because you were porpoising in and out of zone, then you can very easily place stages on either side of the porpoise and incorporate the entire trajectory there. Alternatively, the inline method makes it very fast and easy because you can just type how many perforations per cluster. and you can very quickly modify your designs. So what are the evaluation metrics? If you run five different cluster spacings, what are the best ways to compare the performance of those various sensitivities or scenarios? Well, the first and probably most important is looking at whatever your objective function is versus the cluster spacing. So when we started off today, I gave the example of NPV versus cluster spacing. And here you can see we have two different model assumptions that correspond to different permeabilities. But typically, you might only have one of these lines. And this really helps you visualize what the optimal or optimum is and how sensitive the result to that optimum is. So you can see for these two different permeability assumptions, the low permeability is much more sensitive given the steepness of the curve on either side of the optima than the high permeability assumption is. And so that lends us intuition in terms of how precise or how much time we want to dedicate to finding the exact right optimum. Other comparisons that you might want to make are production versus time, looking at the RTA, looking at a 3D representation of the pressure depletion, and then finally looking at how stress changes. So looking at production versus time, if you run a series of sensitivities, there's a very quick way to do so uh, using the batch generate plots function. And so here you can see a, a batch generated plots and what it does is it takes the three scenarios that I ran, 
and puts them all on the same graph for me. So if I come back to um, the user interface, all I do is I click multi plot. And in this case, I want to do the compound line plot. I'll select a layout that I've created. So for instance, office hours, and that just tells the computer what values to put on each axis. And then you tell it which scenarios you want to plot. So I want to put these three scenarios and I define my axes in that template. And I am not showing a 3D picture in this one. So it doesn't matter which one I select there. And if I press create, it's going to think for a second as it pulls in the data from those three simulations. And I will get my plot of the three scenarios. Now, you'll notice text is quite small. If I were bringing this into a PowerPoint presentation, I could press settings, go and select a larger font. I could also put in a legend. I could modify the legend right, based on what I was plotting. And press OK. So here you can see my legend item, I've made my font bigger, and now I can just copy and paste that directly into my PowerPoint presentation. Things I might look for are any crossovers, right? So here in early time, this gray and blue looked like they may actually cross over. So I might zoom in and see if indeed that's happening. Sometimes it'll happen with different scenarios. It does look like this one is consistent where the blue is always slightly below the gray. But in other cases, that may be a point that I want to key in on is look at where those crossovers are occurring and whether or not that's meaningful uh, to the impact of my sensitivity. Using that same functionality, another line plot you may want to compare is the total propped area or toward a total fracture area. So that's being output for each simulation. And so here are those three same cases again. But this time I just changed my Y axis to be my uh, propped so fracture surface area. And so here I can compare with those various cluster spacings, am I creating more fracture area? Another of my favorites is to look at an RTA plot. So in this case, I have three simulations with the same stage length and all I have done is vary the cluster spacing. So four, four clusters were up to 10. And we can see that all three simulations start with the same slope. So that would imply that they, given that the permeability is the same between each of the cases, that implies then that the total fracture area is the same. But then we see deviation from linear flow occur at different times. And so that is telling us when interference from one cluster to the next is occurring in the model. So if I'm looking at RTA, the two things I tend to look at are the initial slope. Is there a difference in fracture area? For instance, in these three cases, I would expect different initial slopes given that there's different propped fracture surface area. And then secondly, when I look out in time, at what point do they start deviating from linear flow? And does that connote anything about the optimal cluster spacing and interference from one fracture to the next? Using that same example, uh, we can also look at pressure in 3D. So I can scroll through time and look at how pressure is evolving around each of my fractures. And what is the width of depletion? So here with four fracs, do I have longer fractures? And these are zoomed to the same extent. So yes, I can see these fractures are longer. Uh, and are the drainage regions from one fracture to the next overlapping? So we can see we have green around each of these and there is this blue ribbon around the near well area, which has not intersected yet with the next fracture over as compared to the same timestamp 
in the six frac case, you can see that those blue regions are now overlapping. So if we went back to our RTA, that's why we would see that deviation from linear flow occurring earlier in the six frac case than in the four frac case, because those two fractures or any two adjacent fractures are becoming in pressure interference with each other. Secondly, this is a very simplified case, but with a more uh, complex model or advanced model, I might look at does the closer cluster spacing impact then perforation efficiency? And I would then pull that into looking at stresses. So in ResFrac in the 3D viewer, you can plot this delta XX stress or delta stress in the SH min direction. And I would watch as this evolved during fracturing. When I put these cl clusters closer together, do I see a higher maximum in that stress change? So in this one, you can see my max is probably in that 630, 650 range. Uh, if I were to run a second case with cluster spacing half of what this one is, I would expect my, my total stress to go up, maybe up to a thousand or more. And so that is a great way to visualize that and communicate that information. And then finally, if you are uh, squeezing uh, clusters closer together and you see that perforation efficiency diminish, you can plot the stress and look and typically you'll see a high point in the stress distribution around one of the clusters that does not initiate. So again, this can be used to explain why one design versus another may be more optimal. So with that, I will open the floor to questions or comments and even solicit if anyone's had experience or attempts at looking at cluster spacing with ResFrac. Okay, Dave, you're on the call, so you're gonna get a, uh, a call out. Uh, any comments to add as I think you've probably done more cluster spacing sensitivities than anyone on the on the call. Well, uh, I think the reason why there's not a whole lot of questions is because it you made it actually pretty cut and dry. It uh, looks pretty good. So I was actually <laughs> texting you that in a, in a message here. But, uh, you called me out before I could finish the text. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see a, a question, question coming in here from Joe. So Joe, Joe had put a comment here on, you know, is there a difference in average cluster spacing? What are we seeing with our clients? Uh, number of perfs per cluster, et cetera. So that's a very deep question, obviously, with, with many different uh, avenues to go down. I would say from a generalized standpoint, we see tighter cluster spacing in oils than we do in gas. And that's due to the viscosity and compressibility of that hydrocarbon. And then secondly, there is going to be a, a correlation between optimal cluster spacing and permeability. Tighter permeability, generally tighter cluster spacing. And now there is a lower limit on cluster spacing because you'll likely connect between clusters through a cement sheath in, in, a, in a well bore. But I'd say oil wells, we're seeing anywhere from nine to 20 foot cluster spacing is uh, it's kind of a typical range. And for gas, maybe in the 20 to 30, 20 to 35 foot range. But again, those are very rough given the, the contingency of permeability as well as the compressibility viscosity of each of those. Uh, and then on the number of perforations, uh, I would say, and I mentioned this during the perforation friction, discussion, I think the extreme limited entry completions are really gaining momentum, at least where it's feasible from a surface perspective, and operators going down to even as few as one shot per cluster. So I think that kind of started with Paul Weddle published a paper a couple of years ago about balking completions, uh, and subsequently we've seen uh, a lot of continued good work coming out in that regard. Thanks, Garrett. 
I know you're a runner, but now I know you're a little bit of a dancer as well. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe maybe I have a future in politics as well. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I got another question here in text, so give me 10 seconds to read this. Okay, so the question is on setting up that initial resolution. And if you wanted to compare, say, five clusters versus seven clusters across 100 feet, what is the recommended uh, mesh spacing along uh, the well bore? And I guess maybe I'll draw here just to make it a little bit more complicated for you is the distance we actually are going to be concerned with is the distance along SH min, right? So conceivably our well could be at an angle from, oh, from SH min. And so what we want is at least one matrix element in the distance of SH min between these fractures. And so if I was looking, well, I guess that's four, but if I was looking at, at four versus two, I'd want to mesh my simulation for the finest resolution that I might have. And so in this case, I'd want to make my grid blocks uh, I'm just going to butcher this, so I want the time to draw. I, I, I would do it so I, that I had at least four uh, matrix elements across this area. And then if I went down to just two perforations, I would maintain that same mesh resolution. So you, you, you default to meshing to the finest resolution that will be necessary. And so this here is an example of that a priori, I kind of knew maybe the tightest cluster spacing I want to try is seven and a half feet. And so I would mesh my, my matrix along that direct, that SH min direction to be such that it's seven and a half foot elements or less. This is slightly less, this is like five foot. And then I would history match based on the coarser uh, cluster spacing that I actually have historical data for. So in this case, the, the six uh, clusters per stage. And there's no negative accuracy impact of, uh, of going in this way. And you get even more kind of spatial resolution in terms of visualizing the, the pressure between fractures. But where you would sacrifice is if you did the, the opposite, right? So default to the highest resolution that you anticipate eventually running. That answer the question? Perfect. Garrett, I came up with another question. You mentioned earlier about cluster spacing being too tight. Um, I know folks, like you said, are going down into single digit, high single digit, but uh, can ResFrac simulate uh, that communication between clusters along the well bore? Yeah, yeah, and they, we've actually added a, a couple parameters there. So there is, you can have connection basically outside the casing and in that cement sheath, which is kind of a direct hydraulic communication. So you could specify a distance at which those two perforations and resulting fractures would be in direct hydraulic communication as if there was a pipe in between them. Uh, and so that would be kind of like a distance along the outside of the well bore that you think a transverse fracture or longitudinal fracture could, uh, could form. Um, then there's another parameter where you can also apply a pressure drop to that same connection. And so the concept there would be that yes, these things can communicate, but they're going through uh, some cement rubble or something else, right? And so it, it's not just a pipe, but there's some impedance between the, the two as well. Okay. Uh, 
So, yeah, and of course, you know, a priori, I, I probably can't tell you uh, what the distance is that two fractures would then coalesce. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but it, at least we have the mechanism in there where you could sensitize on it and, and see what that would look like or what the impact would be. Well, thanks again, everyone. Great discussion. And um, look forward to seeing you all in two weeks, which will uh, be the, the last one for the, the year.